Our New Testament reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 38 through 39. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, you will find it on page 886. Acts 2, verse 38, reads like this. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Our second reading today is from the book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament, chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. (coughs) Pardon me. And this will be our primary passage that we're going to talk about today, beginning in verse 19. So he, Elijah, set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them, using the equipment from the oxen. He boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Oh God, we thank you for this precious day, and we thank you for all of the sacrifices that those who nurture the lives of others make. Today we rejoice in that, and we ask for your blessings upon every single one of them. Fill us with your grace, O God, and give us wisdom. Give us wisdom from your word that helps us in this sacred task. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, while waiting with his mother in the doctor's office, a three-year-old walked over to a pregnant woman. He inquisitively asked the woman, He said, why is your stomach so big? (laughs) Only a three-year-old, right? Uh, Smiling, the woman replied, I'm having a baby, sweetheart. There's a baby in my tummy. Well, with with big eyes, the little boy asked, is it a good baby? Giggling, the woman said, well, of course, honey. It's a very good baby. Shocked. The little boy asked, then why did you eat him? (laughs) Like I said, only a three-year-old. Boy, oh boy. Well, today is Mother's Day. When we celebrate mothers and everyone involved in the sacred role of mothering, which, as we mentioned in our opening prayer today in worship, includes many folks in many contexts who nurture the lives of children. You know, mothering, in all its form, is hard work that requires great sacrifice. But As I've mentioned before, it's an incredible privilege. It's a great blessing that God allows humanity to participate in the act of creation with God by nurturing new lives that enter this world. Every opportunity that everybody takes to share God's grace with the youngest generations, you know, to care for them, to build relationships of trust with them, 
to be there for them when they're going through difficult times, and above all, to, to teach and illustrate what it means to love and to serve Jesus. This is something that God can work through way in ways that surpass our expectations in estimable ways. See, wisdom, by its very definition, is knowledge that is tested and fashioned by life experience. So wisdom isn't something that anyone is born with. Younger generations have always needed the insights of those who, well, simply put, have been around on this earth longer. Long enough to screw up more times and learn from those mistakes. You know, imparting the wisdom we've attained is something that young people need to gain a better understanding of who they are, who God is, and who God created them to be so that they can serve God faithfully. Because though worldly achievements might meet some of their worldly needs, those things alone can't fill the spiritual void that's at the core of every person's being. Our children need to learn the importance of seeking and nurturing their faith. If they ever seek to feel at peace, to feel their lives have ultimate meaning and purpose in this world, but also beyond it. You know, it's become fashionable today for many in our wider society to talk about faith and spirituality as an option for people. You know, that person decided to do the religious thing. I'm <laughs> glad it works for them. It's not for me. Uh, see, when in reality, faith is that thing that gives us genuine, lasting hope when things happen in life that just don't make any sense. And it's the only thing that can give anyone hope in the face of humankind's greatest obstacle, death. Because let's face it, young or old, wealthy or poor, sick or healthy, every person who's ever lived except God himself in Christ eventually ends up in the same place. The place the ancient Hebrews so eloquently called Sheol, which was really just a nice way of saying dead. So uh, our children need their elders' wisdom to find hope in this world and the next. And what an incredible hope our faith gives us. A hope that sustains us in this world and gives us meaning and purpose beyond it. But our reading from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings speaks to all of this by demonstrating an important principle that helps us adults share our faith and share about life with the generations who follow us. And our passage is part of a larger Old Testament story about the lives of two prophets that we've talked about before. Uh, their names are Eliyahu and Elisha. Uh, that's how they're pronounced in Hebrew, or Elijah and Elisha, as we many times say today. Uh, Elijah, in these stories, he spends years speaking out against leaders in the northern kingdom of Israel who were using a particular form of a Canaanite fertility faith along with, of course, also some brute force and some nasty rhetoric to manipulate, to press, and destroy innocent people's lives for their own benefit. Remember, we've talked 
before about how archaeology has caught up to these stories in a sense and, and that um, the, the uh, skeletons of, of infants that, that had been burned have, have been unearthed in that region of the world uh, that existed at around that time. There's really likely that there was child sacrifice in certain areas going on in the northern kingdom of Israel which gives us a glimpse of the, of the worst of what was happening there in this area. And, and these were the things that Elijah, of course, was, was speaking out against, this injustice. And his unsolicited commentary, it, you know, well, it really ticked off two of these northern Israelite rulers, in particular a king and a queen named Ahab, and Jezebel was her name, or Jezebel, as we say her name um, today. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel, they spent years and many resources chasing Elijah all over the place, trying to kill him so they could get him to shut his mouth. And, uh, you know, being continuously hunted down by tyrannical sociopathic despots can take its toll on a person after a while. You, you just get tired, which is what happened to Elijah. So God speaks to Elijah, encouraging him to share his wisdom and his gifts with another younger person. So Someone in the next generation who can continue Elijah's work. God wants Elijah to take this person under his wing, teach him what he knows so that this person can carry on what Elijah had done. God says in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 and 16, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. And that's where our passage begins. Elijah is responding to God's prompting here. And it begins with, in our passage with Elijah in verse 19, finding and approaching this young man, Elisha, while Elisha is plowing his field, which in ancient Palestine would have been no simple task. So he would have really been focused in on it. And, and as he's doing this, as, a, as Elisha is, is engaged in this physically and, and mentally demanding task, Elijah walks up to him and places his mantle or his outer garment on Elisha, which at the time was an invitation by a leader to become his protege. And we read in verse 20 that Elisha is so excited, he, he eagerly accepts this invitation. In fact, he's so eager, he runs back, he tells mom and dad, and then he actually kills and cooks his oxen and eats them with his family right there in the field. And uh, in subsequent passages, so we read that Elisha goes on to faithfully learn from Elijah and continue his courageous, bold ministry into the, the future. Uh, we're going to, uh, as a part of our series in August, we're going to explore one of those stories specifically about um, Elisha's uh, ministry, and we're going to take a look at you know some of the some of the things he did that blessed people's lives. But one of the things that that really stands out to me in this story um, is that God here speaks to the older person and asks him to approach the younger, not vice versa. See, God, for instance, doesn't ask Elijah to, to wait for Elisha to come to him. He doesn't say, you know, wait by this tree here and I will speak to Elisha and he will come running to you. No, uh, God actually, uh, the text, you know, says this, commands Elijah to take the initiative, to take the leadership in this relationship. And that's still the way that we adults, as mothers, fathers, mentors, what have you, can most profoundly 
impact the lives of young people. Now, you know, today if we decided to take that kind of initiative with our teen by approaching her while she was mowing the lawn and telling her we'd like to help her with her homework when she finished, we certainly wouldn't expect her to stop right then and torch the lawnmower in the middle of the yard, you know, as Elisha did in the story, but the principle still stands. It's, it's really our responsibility to be the ones to seek out, to probe, to consistently reach in to young people's lives and share our wisdom with those youngest among us. If we wait for young people to come to us and, and ask for our wisdom, you know, show me your ways, O oh wise one, then we'll end up missing a lot of opportunities to share what God has given us with them. See, in our story, Elisha is a young man. You know, he's focused on working his way through the most urgent worldly tasks in front of him. He's plowing that field. That's what is most important to him in that moment. It took the older person who'd gotten beaten up a little bit by life, who'd, who'd seen a, a little bit of a, of a bigger glimpse of, of, the, of the picture to help Elisha step back and imagine the grander plan that God had for him. Mothering, parenting, mentoring, it requires the initiative of adults. It requires meeting young people where they are at in life. It requires patiently and respectfully listening to them and their perspective. It requires working to understand their concerns and anxieties about life and faith, where they're coming from, from what perspective they're seeing things. And then with love, sensitivity, genuine concern, it requires patiently and respectfully sharing wisdom that we have, that they have not yet obtained, sharing that wisdom with them about faith and life. All out of a context of love and trust that we've actively worked to nurture between them and us. And yes, this is a tall order. You know, uh, this is in many ways much easier said than done. You know, sometimes when we reach into the lives of younger generations, it, it feels like there's a disconnect there. It feels a little awkward. Sometimes, in some situations, they rebuff our attempts to, you know, uh, bless them and, and share wisdom we know that they need. Uh, but that's because there are differences culturally between generations. There always have been. There are differences culturally between us and them that make that communication difficult. Differences we have to work to overcome. Now, for instance, I'll never forget how horrified I was years ago when I turned to the classic rock station on the radio, the, the oldies station on the radio, and heard the music I grew up listening to. And, and what's worse, my kids didn't even know any of the songs. I, I felt like I was in an episode of The Twilight Zone for a moment. It just didn't seem possible. I said, that's Madonna's new song. That's what I said, you know, and, and Mercy, the song was like 30 years old, but it seemed as if, you know, that was the thing. But, you know, likewise, there are young adults in their 20s today who have never written out a personal paper check. Many don't even have a checkbook. Everything's paid electronically. When I took uh, my son Ethan to open up a checking account recently, uh, shortly after his 18th birthday, um, you know, his, uh, the, the, the guy at the bank was, you know, surprised when uh, I asked uh, for paper checks to go along with that 
checking account. You know, I said, it's a checking account, but apparently that's an option uh, these days. There's a disconnect there, you know. Or, you know, many teens today have, have never used a rotary phone. And they look at you funny when you talk about carburetors on cars, you know. What are those? A carburetor? Is that a new kind of diet? A carb diet or something like that? They don't know. But, you know, when I first heard the term Fortnite, you know, I thought it was maybe a new TV show or a movie or something like that. I had no idea that it was an amazingly popular online video game that, that so many teenagers play uh, today. But I honestly doubt anyone's ever seen a 90-year-old gentleman driving down the street, windows open, playing Taylor Swift's newest song at ear-piercing levels. If you have seen that, please let me know. And if you got a picture of it, please let me see that. Um, but, um, you know, there have always been differences between generations for all sorts of reasons. The world, culture itself, is evolving and we all interact with it differently depending on which stage of life we're in. And so it takes effort on the part of those of us who are older to reach into the lives of the youngest among us. That's why it's so important that we take the initiative because they feel those differences as well and they feel an awkwardness and a disconnect. But they're younger than us. We've been around long. And so if we can overcome that barrier, if we can overcome that, that gulf, God will work miracles through that. If we're willing to try, God can do amazing things through us. Just as a Elijah transformed Elisha's life in our passage, God will surprise us with the blessings that he's able to bestow upon young people's lives through wisdom that we might not have even known that we had. Uh, so that all of us together, all generations, obstacles aside, can fulfill the amazing plans the living Christ has for us in this world and the next. So our scripture readings today, I think, challenge all of us, mothers and others alike, to ask ourselves, is there a young person or young people in my life right now who I could do more to take leadership in reaching out to? And if so, what specifically can I do? Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Amen.